Okay, it looks like it's uh, time for us to go ahead and get started. Hello everyone and welcome to this month's Northwest ATTC webinar. I'm Jennifer Verbeck and I'm your host for today. We're excited to have Alan Mueller presenting for us on the vital role of recovery housing in the continuum of care. Uh, before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping things. First, if you have any questions for our presenter, please type them into the chat box at any time. After he's done speaking, I'll read the questions in the order that they were received. You'll also be getting an email at the end of today's webinar that has a link to a survey in it. Please take that survey. It helps us make sure we're bringing you the content you are most interested in. That email will also have a link to download the slides from today and a link to our website where you'll be able to find a recording of the webinar and that should be available later this afternoon. Additionally, we'll be sending everyone who attends this live webinar a certificate of attendance and that takes us about a week to get those out. You don't need to do anything to get the certificate unless you're watching this in a group. In that case, please have someone in the group email us within a business day with the names and email addresses for everyone who wants a certificate and you'll notice on the screen there our email address is northwest at attcnetwork.org. If you're watching this as an individual, um, your registration will be used for that email address to send you your certificate. Okay, and now on to the webinar. As mentioned earlier, today's speaker is Alan Mua, who was the Dean of Student Services at Skagit Valley Community College in Mount Vernon, Washington for 18 years. In 2011, he and his wife founded New Earth Recovery, which currently operates four recovery residences within Skagit County, Washington. Alan is a founding member and current chair of the Washington Alliance for Quality Recovery Residences, which accredits and provides a wide range of technical assistance to residents, providers, and other stakeholders. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Alan. Thank you for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks, everybody. Um, really, really looking forward to spending some time with you today. Uh, it occurred to me as I was looking at that picture that um, that I haven't seen a tie uh, since at least the middle of March, so uh, which I'm really thankful for personally. Um, and uh, that this one fringe benefit of this whole situation in which we find ourselves. Anyway, it's really good to be with you. I am. Um, I want to just start off. I wish I had time to tell you the whole story of how uh, we got into this recovery housing business or world. Uh, but I, I want to give you at least a couple of highlights because they're, they're relevant to what we want to talk about today. Um, the short version is, is that my wife, uh, Amy, and I were working as volunteer part-time chaplains in our local jail. And, uh, and we realized that we were seeing the same people over and over again. And the factor, of course, that affected the vast majority of, of these uh, folks, the, the thing that they had in common was addiction. And so we, we had a number, you know, in, in a short period of time, we had several kind of epiphanies. And uh, the first one was that the, the system was spending a lot of money to incarcerate people over and over again who weren't seeming to get much better. Um, this very expensive intervention that uh, is the most common intervention, actually, uh, in our area, at least I assume uh, everywhere, um, was not being very effective. Second was that many of the people that we, we talked to uh, wanted to pursue something different. They really wanted to live different lives. And uh, we were there kind of in their moment of crisis to encourage them and, and, uh, and, and it really sensed that, boy, they really did want to do something different. Um, and, uh, but if we wanted to, to address recidivism, if we wanted to address the factors that got them there to begin with, uh, we realized that we needed to be a part of systematically addressing uh, addiction. And so we wanted to be a part of creating the type of environment that would actually help these folks who, who, uh, who we really learned to love and, and connect with on deep levels to, to live out their desire to pursue something different and lasting recovery. So uh, if you fast forward to today, um, we currently, as, as Jen said, we operate uh, four recovery residences uh, in, our, in our area, and we're about to open our fifth, actually, hopefully in the next month or so. 
And, uh, but more importantly, um, the theory that, that changing a person's environment would make a huge difference in their ability to succeed in recovery has proven to be true over and over again. So the number of success stories in our, in our little organization far outweigh the setbacks that we've seen. And uh, as, as all of you know who work in this field, there are certainly setbacks. But this, this whole concept that environment makes a difference, uh, we, we're absolutely convinced of that. And, uh, and it just drives us forward to do more and more and more. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, I want to just talk about, and let's go to the next one, actually. Uh, Perfect. So I want to just talk about a few big ideas, and, um, and and I'm assuming that some of this is, if not self-evident, is something that uh, that you'd be um, you know in touch with. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just stop here, Meg, and talk about a couple of big ideas before we go into the the myths. But um, first of all, the length of the stay in recovery housing is directly proportional to a person's ability to stay in recovery. So the longer a person stays, uh, the, the better their chances. Second, uh, a healthy connection with supportive peers is essential. So interventions that involve uh, peer support, especially in, in residence, show really uh, incredible long-term results compared to other kinds of interventions uh, that, that, that aren't peer-based or that don't have a peer compo component. Another sort of fundamental thing that we've learned is that criminal justice involvement decreases significantly in residents uh, who are living in recovery housing with the kind of support and accountability that's available there. And then uh, overall costs to society are, are lower for people in recovery residences. So in a 2012 study, um, the cost savings to society in healthcare, incarceration, and social services engagement was shown to be somewhere around $29,000 per resident. So this is, this is less money that we as a society spend uh, based on, uh, you know, for, for folks who are in uh, good recovery residences and uh, pursuing their recovery. So, um, and then the last thing I'll say just as a big idea is that, that our residents are twice as likely to be engaged in their communities via, via volunteerism and other engagement than the general population. So we're not just uh, we're not just trying to keep people healthy or just trying to help them kind of work through addiction, but the folks who are actively engaged in this process uh, are, are, are benefiting the community. They're not just kind of neutral folks. So, um, so I wanna talk about two myths. And, uh, and again, I think probably um, my college president used to say that a word to the wise is unnecessary, but I'm gonna just share this with you. I think most of, most of you being wise are in touch with these realities. But the first myth uh, is that people who struggle with substance use disorders can't and, and don't recover. And, um, and, and, and that's, um, as we know, I mean, hopefully you're on this call because you, you believe the opposite is true, but there's just too much evidence uh, all around us uh, of people who are making long-term recovery work. And so many people has, have disproved this particular myth over time. Um, there's another conversation to be had about, uh, uh, about timing and readiness, and, and I'd love to engage in that. We're not gonna be able to dive too deeply into that today, but that of course has everything to do with, uh, with how people make this work. The second myth is, uh, is that is kind of behind popular TV shows like Intervention and, and even the Intervention Movement and, and um, for folks who haven't thought very much about it, but it is basically that if, if you can get someone to rehab or you can get them into treatment, that, uh, that they're good to go, that, that, that that's all they're going to need, they're going to succeed, and that's sort of the end of the battle. Well, again, uh, my assumption is that, uh, is that everyone on this call knows otherwise, um, you know, it, it, to, to uh, sort of give up at the end of treatment on somebody is like sending somebody who just had major heart surgery into the parking lot of the hospital and saying, and saying, good luck, uh, you know, try to eat better. Um, it's just not the way that, uh, it's not the way that, that, that we would treat any other chronic uh, disorder. So, um, so we, we then need to talk about, well, what are the environments then that are going to help this happen? So let's go to the next slide. Uh, I just want to briefly, many of you have probably seen this. This is just SAMHSA's, um, uh, from SAMHSA's guidance document on recovery housing. Uh, I'm just going to read it uh, verbatim because I think it, it, it speaks to uh, just a general overview of what we're talking about today. But recovery houses are safe, health, uh, healthy, family-like, substance-free living environments. 
that support individuals in recovery from addiction. Uh, while recovery residences vary widely in structure, and we're going to talk about that, all are centered on uh, peer support and a connection to services that promote long-term recovery. Recovery housing benefits individuals in recovery by reinforcing uh, substance-free lifestyle and providing direct connection to other peers in recovery, mutual support groups, and uh, recovery support services. So substance-free does not prohibit uh, prescribed medications taken as directed by uh, a licensed prescriber, such as, uh, um, such as pharma, chemo, uh, sorry, <laughs> pharma co uh, specifically approved by the FDA uh, for treatment of opioid use disorders, as well as other medications with FDA approved uh, um, indications for treatment of co-occurring disorders. So uh, I, I felt the need to read the whole thing because there are, it, this addresses several issues um, around the idea of abstinence and substance free. And so um, I, I appreciate that that's a rich definition and that, uh, and that recovery residences that uh, provide pathways and that allow uh, residents to, um, to really pursue their health in as many avenues as possible uh, really are the ones who succeed and, 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 and provide, uh, yeah, provide the best environments for their folks. So as the definition states, there's a wide variety of types of residences out there. Um, so as quickly as I can, I, I want to just sort of lay those out for you. And this is where um, um, just the, the big idea around all of this is that one size doesn't fit all and that, uh, and that recovery residences really, there is quite a lot of variety within. So I'm going to do my best to, to whip through this as quickly as I can, but I want to just give you a sense of what the world uh, recovery housing looks like. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and uh, the next, uh, so so what's happened is that um, there are so many um, ways or lenses that you can see all of these uh, houses through. There's just a lot of variety out there. And so the National Alliance for Recovery Residences uh, decided that the best way to kind of categorize or to group housing would be according to levels of care. So as we talk through uh, four levels of care, you'll start to see how uh, hopefully any kind of residence that you would run into would fit into one of these categories. And then we're gonna spend a little time talking about uh, so what, so why does that level of care matter and, and how might you uh, make, help, help somebody make the best choice about where they might go. Um, so uh, let's do the next one and, uh, and let's talk about staffing. So you'll see uh, this is this. They're going to we're going to have to sort of look at several lenses here. But you see sort of four levels of care across the top there. Um, and uh, it's important to say as a caveat that no level, no one level of care is better than any other. Um, it's not the goal of a level one residence to become a level two residence and so on. Uh, there's no there's no competition here. Um, bottom line is we are short in all these categories. So there's not enough of any of them. We could use more of, of all of them. So, um, so if someone is doing a, a great job at level three and really supporting their residents well, we need them to keep operating at that level uh, and same for all the others. So in the matrix, uh, there are four levels um, and, uh, and, and all residences are, are uh, necessary. And um, so, when we one way to sort of think about the differences though is to look at staffing so we're going to start looking at uh, let's hit the next slide uh at oxford houses so oxford houses generally speaking level one homes are oxford houses there are probably level one homes out there that that aren't a, a part of oxford but we probably wouldn't know about those that might be a group of people who say hey uh we're interested in in pursuing a sober lifestyle let's all get together set up some some just some guidelines around how we want this place to operate and let's pay our own way and make that happen. So because those folks don't have to be licensed, accredited in any way, they don't need outside assistance, they're just gonna operate. So the level one houses that we do know of are, are Oxford. So generally speaking, um, um, they're self-supporting, they're peer run. Uh, and while there are resource people in the Oxford organization who help houses uh, form and deal with uh, issues and concerns along the, the way that may arise, uh, most on-ground decision-making is left to the residents. So this is really kind of a self-operated model. 
Um, so we'll talk more about Oxford as we talk about some other lenses, but let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, the next slide uh, would be, or the next category would be sober homes. So you might have heard of sober living or sober living home. Um, and that, that would be uh, somebody owns a home. Uh, they're often owned uh, or rented by an offsite operator who sets up some structure for residents. Uh, there's usually an on-site house manager who's known or hired by that, uh, by that owner. Um, and who enforces the policies that are set up. So there's sort of a, there's a, there is a policy structure of sorts. Um, this person, the house manager type might orient new residents. They might create some sense of community uh, within the house. Um, and, and, but they're basically uh, residents, generally speaking, these are self-operated in that financially they're self-sustaining. So again, uh, the housing operator probably isn't receiving outside funds to do this unless they have contracts or something that's sort of on a per resident basis, but they're typically, um, they're typically just taking, you know, what it costs them to run the house uh, or operate the home dividing that by the number of residents, charging that in, in, in rent uh, or program fees, and then, and, and that's it. So, um, so again, no staff per se, uh, paid staff typically, but, but somebody is there usually uh, in, in maybe in lieu of rent or some room and board kind of compensation, maybe a little stipend or something, but that would be like a house manager person. All right, so the next level is, uh, is level three. Um, Level three homes generally have uh, some sort of paid staff. They do a variety of things depending on the residents, but those might include case some case management, some life skills training and coaching. They may oversee the structure of the home, uh, including you know curfew enforcement, uh, whatever whatever kind of specific uh, kind of structure uh, or components that that are in place. The staff is there to kind of oversee those things. These homes uh, would be generally described uh, as having programs. So you might say, I live in a sober living home, but I'm a part of a program in a, in a level three home. So this, uh, we might call these uh, recovery houses, uh, recovery homes, um, but, uh, and there's some variety across the country in terms of whether that staff is credentialed or certified or not. Um, and so that 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 could vary quite a bit. Uh, this is probably the most uh, diverse category in that regard. But uh, level three providers would serve residents looking for more structure post treatment or post incarceration. Somebody who just knows that they're going to need uh, some some lane bumpers. Maybe they're not probably not working full time or maybe even part time while they're going through the program that's offered at the residence. But generally, critical uh, clinical services such as, such as outpatient treatment mental health counseling, those are available in the community. So there might be some sort of partnership that the level three house has with, a, with, um, with an outside agency where they just may do that via referral. Um, generally speaking, clinical services aren't offered on site in level three homes according to the NAR model. Um, so level four, um, would be what all what we would really refer to as treatment. So these are uh, this is where clinical services happen on site. Uh, staff are credentialed professionals, uh, and the, the facility itself is uh, has to attain some sort of licensure in order to do that. Stays are generally short, 30, 60, 90 days at most, um, but they're they're they're, they're clinical settings. So, um, all right, so let's, let's look at another lens. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and uh, we're just gonna kind of keep, keep sort of differentiating these a little bit. So another lens uh, we wanna use is, um, is, is the levels of service. So they all provide, so let's click, uh, click the next button there. There we go. So all of the um, providers at all these levels provide housing. So they're all a place to sleep at night uh, and, and provide some safety. So that's, that's one. So the next one is they all operate on the social model. And by that, by that all we mean is that, um, that if something is going to be a residence and not just a straight clinical intervention where all people get are clinical connections, they're getting peer connections, then, then there's a social model involvement. And so so our, our movement, if you will, or our field is very much based on the idea that, uh, that people in recovery or who are moving toward recovery have uh, benefit greatly from connections with other people who are doing the same thing. 
and uh, there's just tons of research that backs that up. So, so we would say that in order for something to be called a recovery residence of any kind, it needs to be based on a social model. Even with clinical components, there's still a vital kind of uh, in levels uh, three and four, uh, four for sure, there, there would be some sort of um, uh, social connections. And I think you would find that in most treatment centers that we'd find uh, around here. Um, so the next, uh, next click, um, so starting somewhere in level two, some level two homes, you'll see some support elements like coaching or maybe in-house support meetings um, and other requirements or, or just components that start to look like a program. And uh, certainly in level three and level four, that gets more and more structured. Uh, but, but there are some level two homes that provide that uh, depending on kind of the philosophy and the, and the desire of the, of the owner of those homes to do something. So um, level three homes, you see specific programs. So next, uh, next click, uh, level three, you see specific programs that are around um, life skills. So to prepare residents for their next transition. Um, so it will be things like financial management, uh, conflict resolution skills, um, job, uh, job skills, job placement, resume writing, all those kinds of the, the sky's the limit, a lot of life skill kind of things that again, depending on the philosophy and the, 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 re, the purpose uh, that kind of got that, that provider started, you'll see a lot of really interesting components there that are added into the program. Um, so then uh, the next click, level four then, is you see, of course, the, the clinical interventions. So, um, so that has to do, uh, of course, with uh, mental health counseling, uh, the SUD supports, et cetera. Um, and those are probably familiar to most of you. Um, uh, one more variety, one more click, um, one more uh, sort of variation of all of this is there are providers of clinical services that will maybe be an outpatient treatment center or something like that. And they'll have an accompanying uh, residential component because they, what they did is they did the math and they realized that, um, boy, our residents or, or our clients who have safe living environments do so much better. We're going to actually set up a separate, uh, a separate but connected um, arm of our organization that that provides them that housing, or maybe we'll pay for that housing externally. Generally speaking, that's at level two. So there's some structure around it, but there's not programming or clinical services that happen in the in that housing environment. They happen uh, they happen in the in the treatment center, but but the treatment center then um, has a real vested interest in that housing uh, for the success of their clients. So. Um, you might have heard this called the Florida model, and uh, there's a whole other can of worms and that there are some providers that got in trouble in Florida a little while back because that started to look a little bit too commingled. It started to look like uh, a little bit of Medicaid fraud going on. And, and so, um, uh, again, that's a whole other presentation, uh, but, but that's something we try to avoid in those kinds of relationships. So ultimately, we want our residents to be deciding how they how they do their their recovery. So. Uh, when they're locked into too many components that are too sort of in lockstep, then that, that can sort of put that uh, in jeopardy. So, so uh, next slide, um, and uh, and one more click. So, how how do you know what's going to be the best uh, fit for somebody? So, um, if if there were capacity, uh, and that's a huge ish if at the beginning of this sentence here, um, because there's just not enough capacity in in, in any of these categories. Um, but what, what, where would we place somebody and what kind of criteria would we, would we use to make decisions about that? Um, and this gets a little, I'll just tell you that on the ground, this is a really difficult uh, question to answer. And I think as we get through, um, go through some of these, you'll, you'll get a sense of how there's some subjectivity in this, uh, but there's some real challenge in making these decisions. So, um, so let's go to the next slide. And, um, and the first, and one more click, uh, the first thing that we look at is recovery capital. So again, for most of you, I don't need to define this, but essentially, uh, does the potential resident or client have a support system? Have they been doing this for long enough to have, uh, to have those people connections, to have a knowledge base, to know where the resources are that will support them? Um, is there some internal and external kind of underpinnings that help them um, 
help them navigate their recovery. So if they have a lot of those things in place, maybe maybe they're entering a recovery residence after a fairly long period in recovery, and maybe they had uh, what they would call a slip. And so that sort of, uh, maybe they come out of treatment or out of incarceration. They know the resources. They may be able to do fine in an Oxford house, level one house or level two house. It doesn't have a whole lot of structure, okay? Um, so the next, next uh, click is uh, we would look at complexity and severity of their disorders. So um, again, this gets a little bit uh, subjective in terms of we're not clinicians, we don't make decisions based on, you know, we're not diagnosing mental health conditions, but, but there are some factors we could look at um, uh, to say, wow, this is a person who uh, is really still very much in an acute phase uh, of recovery. And so for that person, the higher level of support is gonna be important. Um, this is really frustrating for some of us who are trying to make these decisions when we know that somebody, the severity of their disorder and maybe their recovery capital would really be best or lack of recovery capital would be best served in a higher level uh, residence, but there isn't one available. And so the question is, do we, do we say, yes, we'll take them and do our best to support them? Because uh, the other alternative is that they, they're out on the street or they're in a much less healthy environment. So those are kind of the on the ground decisions that ha we have to make all the time. Uh, the next, next click, uh, stages of development. So we all know that um, some clients aren't developmentally able to make life work yet in, in a lower structured environment. And so if they, if they don't have support systems, they don't have uh, that recovery capital that we're talking about um, and developmentally uh, just, uh, you know, kind of live a lot more spontaneously. They haven't developed uh, some, some of those skills um, necessary to, to really do uh, even just relationship skills with to navigate conflict with, with other residents in a low structured environment that can be uh, really hard for them and destructive and ultimately lead, lead to failure. And, uh, and we really don't, the risk of taking in somebody um, at too low a level of support who needs more support, especially developmentally, is um, that, that we just aren't able to, um, you know, that, that they'll fail again, essentially, that, that, that this will be another place that kicked them out, uh, and then they'll take that on themselves. So we really want to place people at the right level so that they can succeed. Uh, and success, of course, breeds more success. So uh, another click. Um, one value that uh, is, is uh, important in all of them, we believe that it should apply everywhere, is that uh, as, as people are able, they take more and more responsibility for their own recovery process. So we really want recovery to be a self-guided process as much as possible, even with a higher level of structure to the extent that we can give uh, options and choices and the ability for a person to, to self-determine uh, that just feels healthy so that as they gain in these other areas and maybe move to a, a lower level of care, or maybe even become completely independent in their housing at some point that they've built uh, what th that they've built it uh, kind of on their own terms and that they've, they've uh, created something for themselves that's going to be sustainable. And finally, uh, one more click um, is that uh, the, the reality on the ground is that there's not enough housing in any of these categories. So the challenges that we're talking about here are really saying, do we take somebody in, even if it's not the best fit in terms of level of care, or do we risk, you know, sending them somewhere where they're not going to succeed or to someplace that's unsafe? And so you'll see all the time providers having to make that really hard call to say, well, I don't think we have what it takes to support this person where they are right now, but if we don't take them, nobody, there's, no, there's nobody who will. And so we, 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 we're gonna take that risk. And I'll tell you, as having done that, uh, there have been success stories of people who, you know, when you look at this chart, uh, you just don't know how it's gonna work, but yet it does. So, so the human spirit is resilient and with a kind of right sort of, sort of support, uh, I think can, can overcome, you know, even this beautiful diagram. So, um, all right, so that's a, that's a real kind of overview of, uh, of kind of levels of care and, and how we sort of see the different um, uh, uh, types of recovery housing. And again, 
uh, our assertion is that most any resident you find will fit somewhere in that grid and, uh, and using this, this, this sort of set of criteria. Again, if we had the ability to, if we had ample amounts of housing at all of these levels, we could place people where they're going to benefit the most and grow and really uh, develop and, uh, and, and, and flourish. So the next I want to talk about um, the current situation. And I know, um, so let's click to the next slide here. Um, and I think I'm going to stick here for a little bit. But if you're like me, uh, you've spent a lot of time um, looking at your context in terms of how you're how you're serving your clients during the current pandemic. And um, this probably isn't your first webinar talking about that. Uh, so I realize I risk just repeating things that are uh, that, that you've heard or thought a lot about, probably maybe even more than than we have. But um, but I just want to talk about some lessons learned for us and. And, um, and then I'll be really interested in, in our conversation together to, to hear some of your perspectives and, and thoughts on this. But first, of course, uh, like, uh, like a number of you, we're seeing um, an increase in relapse rates uh, as the pandemic continues. Uh, there's this uh, perfect storm of kind of anxiety, boredom, isolation, and now stimulus checks. And all of that kind of come together uh, to create uh, kind of this this environment where where relapse is uh, is is for some people more likely, and so we're certainly seeing that. Um, but what we provide our residents on our best days is a good antidote to those factors. Um, and uh, it, it, what I mean by that is that residents can still engage rather than isolate. They can participate at, at least at least in house activities with others. Um, Houses generally provide technolo technology connections to uh, to the rest, to other recovery services. As you all know, some people do better in that kind of milieu than others. Uh, the, the technology environments, um, some people really resist them and have had trouble connecting, and so that's not a perfect solution, but, but at least in a housing environment, uh, they, they can do that. Um, healthy connection is a good uh, remedy for anxiety. So as people, um, experience uh, just the anxiety of boy just I get anxiety watching the news and watching the fighting and all of the partisanship and, and everything that's come with this particular um, crisis that we're in the middle of um, is really anxiety provoking and so so we, we just know that processing that with other people um, the right other people and other people who are trying to be healthy in the midst um, can be can be really healthy uh, so we've seen return to use in residents for sure, and we've we've also seen the extraordinary value of connection. So um, I'll, I'll tell you just an anecdotally, as I've talked to other providers, and certainly what we experienced at our own homes is at the beginning of the pandemic, um, our residents uh, really started to rub each other the wrong way. Um, There's just tension was rising. There was sort of the fear of the unknown and all the anxiety around health and um, you know that's kind of out there all that's going on and people who would normally leave the house to escape uh, their, their their housemates uh, or to escape sort of anxiety within the house really didn't have places to go and so what started to happen it, we started to see is that people had to figure out how to stay in the house and how to make relationships work and they may or may not have literally been there uh, 24 seven, but they may, they were there certainly more than they were as their work opportunities dried up and so on. And so what we saw is, um, is, is, is people needing to kind of figure out, well, if I'm going to stay and make this work and I don't really have anywhere else to go, um, I, I have to figure out how to get along with these folks. And so what we've seen, uh, uh, uh certainly with some exceptions, but, but, but generally speaking, uh, and I've talked to other providers and seen the same is that is that residents have really gotten deeper into relationship with each other. And as we know, um, you know, we, we use this term and this phraseology a lot that, that the opposite of, uh, of addiction is not sobriety, it's, it's connection. And so um, there's this sort of laboratory. We, we think of ourselves always as laboratories for people to learn how to do connection better. And that the deeper, the better they get at deepening connection, the more, um, the, the more uh, sort of 
protected they are against return to use. And so we are uh, really encouraged generally, even though we're seeing some relapses, we're encouraged to see in other residents just their capacity grow to figure out how to do relationship to the current crisis is in part uh, responsible for that. Um, so it's, it's uh, um, obviously in, in, in residences who have a higher level of care, so I have staff available to help residents process those things. They have a little bit more capacity to, 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 to do that. Um, but from our colleagues at Oxford even, we're hearing the same kinds of things that, uh, that residents have had to figure some, some things out about how to make life work because you can't just leave like you used to be able to. Uh, and if you do, the, 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 the sort of the consequences are, are, are worse. So that's anecdotal. Uh, I, I don't have a, you know, I, I certainly can't point to a study. I'm sure there will be some uh, down the road, which will be interesting to look at. Um, but I think for me, it just helps sort of reinforce the, what we believe about environment and the capacity of the right environment to help somebody do recovery better. Um, I want to, uh, let's go to the next slide. And I want to talk to you about um, the, the social determinants uh, of health. And this was something that as we were talking about this webinar um, and, uh, and, and watching what was going on uh, in our nation kind of racially and, and with an eye towards, boy, you know, how has equity um, been uh, impacted uh, by all of this? So sort of putting all these factors together. So COVID um, alongside racial tension, um, and uh, just all the things that are happening out there, these conversations have kind of collided. And so it got us asking the questions around, well, how does living in a recovery residence um, sort of impact how healthy people can be, especially in moments of crisis? Uh, and that's all people. So people who come to us disadvantaged in some way or other, or, or as we, as, as, you know, as we say a lot, uh, talking about um, the starting line is at different places for different people. Um, so I just took a look at um, the, the social determinants of health, this list, uh, typically uh, 17 factors that are, that are considered. And we found that most of those factors, more than half of them, are somehow addressed in most recovery residences. So I'm not going to read them to you. This is the, the first slide, lists uh, the first few. And then if you want to make, click on the second slide, um, those are just the remainder of the ones that I sort of pulled from the bigger list to say, well, if you're in a recovery residence that um, that is uh, really um, uh, functioning well, there's opportunities here. And again, more than half of these areas to, that are addressed and, uh, and people have this opportunity in these rich, uh, healthy environments to, um, to thrive. And that's regardless of how, what they come in with. They, there's this sort of uh, hopefully kind of equalizing opportunity in community to make something work uh, for them. So um, anyway, there's a lot of conversation that can be had about that. Maybe that provokes some, some questions uh, or comments from some of you, but um, it just was a real rich experience for me to think about um, what we can provide people in in the way even though they come in uh at varying you know with varying uh, environmental factors that have that have brought them to where they are there's some things we can do to um uh to, to make a significant impact uh on on a lot of these so um i think let's uh if we if we can i'm open to if we want to go to the next slide and just um take any questions there's some contact info for us there um, as, uh, as Jen said in the introduction, I currently am the, the chair of an organization in Washington State called the Washington Alliance for Quality Recovery Residences. We are an affiliate of the National Alliance for Recovery Residences, and so we, we do certification for folks um, who uh, are either have been operating uh, recovery residents at one level or other, um, generally focusing on level two and level three residences. Oxford uh, has their own um, set of uh, guidelines that they uh, that their that their um, houses adhere to, and so in a lot of ways we're 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 kind of creating something for the rest of the the field that Oxford already has in place. So generally speaking, level two and level three residences, um, we work to to uh, to accredit those, and through that accreditation process, then they they um, gain access to our list. So they be they get on our list of providers and then that list uh, can be accessed by people um, 
in, uh, in our field. So uh, treatment providers, um, uh, people in jails, uh, the departments of corrections, et cetera, uh, can have access to our list and, and, and know that they are uh, referring people to places that have been vetted. Uh, and so that's a really high value of ours is that uh, the word quality uh, in our name. So we're the Washington Alliance of Quality Recovery Residences. We're really trying to set and enforce a standard uh, as well as uh, help people get to a standard that we can all feel better about for people in uh, who are in, who are just by definition vulnerable and in need of good care. So I think I'll I'll leave it there. That's the contact information at the bottom, and I'll open it up, Jen. I'll turn it back over to you to to um, throw out some questions and comments. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate that. Um, uh, we've re received a couple of questions in the chat box, and I'll try to summarize those as best as I can. Uh, how do you handle the not in my backyard problem in the community when wanting to bring a sober resident into that community. Yeah, so we do a whole webinar on that. <laughs> uh, but I, I'll say that relationship is is the best thing we can do. So we're 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 careful. We don't um, we don't necessarily announce ourselves when we move into a neighborhood. There's no requirement that we do that. Um, we are uh, protected by the Fair Housing Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, which uh, allow us to have groups of people living together for mutual support. And so, so we're protected by federal law. So, so nobody can say, hey, you can't live here or your, your place can't, uh, can't operate here. There are some local codes and so on that, that endeavor to do that. There are some, so, so obviously what we wanna do uh, as providers is work cooperatively with, uh, with uh, jurisdictions and municipalities and neighborhoods. What we found is um, that uh, once we move into a neighborhood and people, uh, we wanna have the best looking yard in the neighborhood. We wanna be the quietest house in the neighborhood. We want there to be not a lot of traffic coming in and out. We don't want the place to look like a drug house um, when, when we're trying to really work uh, to, to, to be something very different than that. And so our residents, um, we, and we encourage, uh, we, as providers, we talk about this, we want them to just be uh, model citizens. And most, most, if not all of them, really want to live in a neighborhood. They want to be good neighbors. And so we have some guidelines around that. So some examples might be no loud music, uh, smoking only in designated areas. Um, uh, so so um, there's not much, there are some exceptions, but there's not much people can do about um, keeping a residence from coming into their neighborhood. So the real work becomes building relationships and becoming a healthy part of a neighborhood so that eventually we win people over. And we've seen it happen enough that, uh, that we feel like that's, that that's, that that's the ticket. Um, there are unfortunately folks who come to us, of course, um, as neighbors who, who just, uh, maybe because of bad experiences they've had in the past, or their own uh, baggage that they bring um, that, that, that can make that a really difficult struggle. And, and uh, so three out of our four current houses uh, in our little organization uh, have fantastic relationships with neighbors. One, we're still building the relationship and it's a process. Um, anyway, a lot more to say about that, but, I, <laughs> but uh, it's, it really is a, it's a factor and we, and we work on it. Great, thank you, Alan. <clears throat> um, there's another one here. I'm, I'm going to try to combine these into one question. Uh, are the homes in your listings all over the country or just in the Northwest? And do you have any of them in Oregon? So uh, Oregon is just now, I'll start with that. Oregon is just starting to form a new affiliate. Uh, so a new um, chapter of the National Alliance for Recovery Residences is starting to form in Oregon. And so we're just uh, starting to make contact and, and help them. Uh, the national organization is helping them kind of get on their feet. And I imagine we'll be collaborating back and forth. Um, our list, the Walker directory that you'll find at our website is just Washington State. Uh, and is pretty small at present because we just started um, uh, accrediting a little more than a year ago, but it's growing and there are a number of people in the pipeline, so that list will grow. But the, the number of states or the states who have uh, NAR affiliates in them uh, will all have lists of their own. So in the Northwest right now, uh, Washington is kind of the outpost, um, uh, but again, Oregon is getting on board before too long and we're hoping to see other states uh, follow. 
um, but it's it's been um, it's it's been slow going uh, in those other states so far. Um, we we have some Alaska connection as well that we're hoping to uh, we're hoping to build uh, an affiliate up there uh, too. So um, so we're getting there. We're we're in the early days in 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 most of the West. California is the, is the oldest state. They've been doing this the longest, and they have a very well well developed system. And those lists are are uh, really you know hundreds and hundreds of residences down there. But we're not there yet. We're going to be. We hope. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another one here. We are setting up a new level three home. What is your best advice for us? I uh, would love to talk to you uh, uh, offline, um, but I, I think it's that uh, really establishing what what you want uh, your residents to get out of that, uh, uh, of your program. So what's gonna be the flavor uh, of, of residents that you wanna create? Most level three providers that go into it have a sense of some of those sort of benchmarks or those um, deliverables, those those outcomes that they that they would like to see in their residents. Obviously, keeping in mind that, that we want residents to be self-directed in their recovery, but we want people to choose us by the distinctives that we have to offer as well. And so, um, I think uh, I, I think my best advice would be let's have some conversation. Uh, would love to just talk and and um, and help wherever we can and. Uh, we're working on setting up some mentorship kinds of conversations uh, with our existing members and people who are just getting going. And even if you're out of Washington State, we'd love to love to talk to you about that. Great. I'll just encourage that person to take down your your contact information there then. And um, there was also sure. someone that had mentioned in the chat box that they submitted a, an RFP for um, mental health court participants and that they would like to contact you as well. So I'll just. Yeah, that would be great. We've worked uh, in our little organization up here in, in Northwest Washington. We've worked with uh, our local uh, mental health court and uh, had some really great. So uh, I don't need to tell this group, but, but dual diagnosis is so common. So folks in, in recovery from co-occurring disorders is, is more common than not. So that's a really nice marriage actually. Great. I'm going to try to sub summarize this question. Uh, hopefully I get it right. Uh, so a provider at a level two and level three cannot have a requirement for their client to live in their housing and be enrolled in their program solely, um, not include other program entities. If I understand the questions right, it, it's if, if is, is a clinical setting or a clinical provider that wants to have a housing component and is wondering can they require people to be enrolled in their program in order to be in their housing um i think they can do that um but i i i i, I think we probably should have some some conversation um and i probably need to check in a little bit uh, make sure that i'm on solid ground to avoid what i'll call the florida problem um, I think there are ways, uh, so, so, you know, we have a local provider that provides housing for their, uh, they have the drug court, the SUD portion of the drug court contract, and they have housing that is available for drug court uh, participants, and it's exclusively available for that group of people. So somehow they've figured out a way uh, that that's not uh, in violation. So I, I, I think there's a way to do that. Um, that just say, you know, that this housing is designed to be a support structure for this particular treatment program. Um, but I don't want to, I, I don't want to lead you astray there. I think there are ways to do that. I, I, but I, um, I don't know what the distinctives need to be that would keep it uh, above board. So uh, right off, right off hand, it's worth it, worth another conversation. Great. Yeah. And that person just responded and said, yes, I got the, the question correct. So I'll just encourage them to uh, reach out to you for further clarification on that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to dig into it a little bit. It's a good, it's a good question. Uh, what I will say, I'll just add on is that there's a provider in Minnesota. Um, the way that they do it is they provide funding for housing for their clients. So the provider is an outpatient treatment provider and they provide, they have, Boy, I want to say dozens of homes at least that they help subsidize with, uh, with by paying the fees of their clients in those homes. And many of those homes wouldn't exist today if it weren't for that outpatient provider that is that's sort of pumping uh, funds through their clients into those into those homes. 
that provider um, is contemplating expansion into the Northwest actually. And so we're in, in pretty regular conversations with them about what it would look like for them to work with our accredited providers uh, to expand into here. And so what they, just like I said, what they found is that um, supporting their uh, supporting their clients with housing uh, has been hugely beneficial to their success rate. So uh, we know that to be true. So anyway, there, there are a lot of ways that that could look. Great. Uh, let's see. This one is, um, as COVID uh, circumstances persist, are there additional challenges for recovery housing that might be anticipated in the autumn months? Yeah. I think so. I mean, I think for some, it's it's about um, residents' ability to pay their fees. And so, um, you know, if there are obviously there are programs out there that will help help with that. But um, if if you have a, a group of residents in your recovery home who are all kind of self-pay, let's say it's a level two home. And these folks have been working in order to do that, and the work has been harder to find. That has really impacted providers. So I'd say financial is 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 a big consideration for some providers, depending on their mix of of income and how they kind of stay afloat. Level three and level four providers are largely uh, funded through other sources, or at least they have, so they're not quite as dependent on on uh, on fees uh, from their residents to pay the bills. Um, and it, that's hard. I mean, it's we're, we're obviously very supportive of uh, of the the rules that you can't uh, ask somebody to leave for financial reason. I mean, that's that makes total sense in the current crisis. Um, but also, a provider has to stay afloat somehow. And so, how long can that um, scenario kind of continue without external sources of funding for somebody who really level two providers and level one providers, for that matter, are really running their operations on a razor thin line that's dependent on residents paying their paying their fees so that that's a real challenge for them uh, the other one of course is the ongoing how do you keep community going uh, that is supportive to people who are stressed and maybe don't it, it seems like a, an oxymoron but you're stressed out but you don't have enough to do um, those two things can sort of co-occur and when they do it's it's a real challenge for for, for residents, so how do we support them? I think what we have decided with our staff is just said, we've got to watch folks. We've got to keep an eye on our residents more than ever now because people who um, used to sort of cope with th th their kind of recovery strategy, a main one was just to stay, bu stay busy, which we wouldn't say is the ultimate best strategy, but it did keep some people kind of going and it kept them occupied at least while they were doing the work of recovery. So. So I think the real challenge is, is really being in touch with our residents. Wonderful, thank you. Um, where in importance to longer term recovery is employment, especially given the problems with employment and those with felony convictions? Yeah, it's hugely important. Um, so in most, I, I, I venture to say in most level three providers um, are looking to sort of transition folks into employment looking to get people uh, you know so all of those sort of life skills that we work on with our with our clients uh, to get them are, are, are mostly about helping them get to where they can be functional in a work setting if they're able and um, and then in level two and level one residences of course uh, they are again largely dependent on their folks having income um, there's something about uh, um, being about something. And again, this is a whole other webinar, but I, we've really come to believe that people need to be about something. They need to be able to, at the end of the day, say, I did that, or I accomplished that, or I made a difference here. Um, language that we use is that we were in this, there's a, there's a, it's kind of a spiritual component to this as well, is that we were made for intimacy and impact. And so if you think about those as two primary components of recovery, that's pretty um, it's compelling, you know, that we need deep connection with each other in order to function well. And we need to be able to make a difference in the world. And we need to be able to feel like we're contributing to something bigger than ourselves. And I think that would line up very well with what uh, other, you know, 12 step models and others would say that, that we need to be about um, doing something that makes a difference. So uh, that was a far ranging answer. I, I hope that helped. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was helpful. <laughs> Uh, this is the last one, and then I'll probably do some wrap-up and go through closing remarks unless we have time for a couple more. But 
what about treatment providers? Our local drug court is aligned with one provider for mental health and SUD, but we are hoping to allow folks to get treatment where they are comfortable. Mm. Yeah, so again, um, ideally uh, that would be possible. So if, if, if the value of people being able to um, choose their own recovery pathway at some level, obviously in a structured program like a drug court, there are gonna be some, there are gonna be some markers or some benchmarks that need to be met, but. Are there ways um, that that can be met by multiple providers or within, you know, if a, if a provider is capable of, uh, and I'm talking about, a, say, an outpatient treatment provider is capable of, uh, of, of providing the kind of service or the kind of um, uh, treatment that, uh, that's required by the program, does it matter uh, where that person goes? Can, that, can, the, can the drug court program support that in multiple agencies? Um, so my, my experience in drug court is somewhat limited to our local environment. We work really closely with our drug court program here as a, as a residence provider, but we've, um, the model I'm familiar with is there's kind of one provider for each service and, and maybe it's just easier to manage that way because you have people on staff in those agencies who are connected to your program. But um, I would hope there could be a way to think about that more, more broadly over time. That, the, that, that, a, that a client could guide some of that decision-making. Wonderful, well, thank you. Uh, we've received a lot of comments and, and people saying that they appreciate your time today and, and a lot of thank you. So we appreciate you taking the time to present for us today, Ellen. I'm just gonna go through a, a couple of wrap-up items. Uh, please remember to fill out our evaluation survey for today's webinar by clicking on the link within the email we'll be sending out later today. It's also provided there in the chat box. Um, be sure to join us for our next webinar on August 26th. And the title of that webinar is still to be determined, but it will have a focus on motivational interviewing and organizational leadership. Um, and. Uh, Thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time to meet with us today. And uh, thank you, Alan. Thanks, all. It's good to be with you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.